Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our uh, 16th Annual Women's Policy Leadership Institute. It's keynote night. It's very exciting. Uh, we've been looking forward to this at the Montana Women Vote Office for quite some time, and I am really excited for tonight's session. Thank you all for joining us. We've still got some folks coming in, so I'm going to run through a few tech notes and housekeeping items as folks are joining, and then we will go ahead and get started. Um, this is, like I said, the 16th Annual Women's Policy Leadership Institute. WPLI is a program of Montana Women Vote. Montana Women Vote works statewide to engage low-income women and families, LGBTQ folks, two-spirit and non-binary folks, Black, Indigenous, and people of color, and their allies in the democratic process as informed voters, policy advocates, and community leaders. We're really grateful for all of the presenters who are joining us this week, and especially to Aubrey for joining us tonight. And we're grateful that you're able to be here with us tonight. Just a few things about how you can participate tonight. This panel is webinar style, so that means everyone who's joining as a participant is muted automatically, and you won't be able to unmute yourself without permission. But we do encourage you to ask questions and chat with other participants using both the chat function and the Q&A function. If you have questions that you want Aubrey to address at the end of the session, I encourage you to put them in the Q&A box. You can use the chat, but we'll be sure to keep a close eye on that Q&A box. So if you want to differentiate between sharing your thoughts, interacting with other folks, um, giving you know high fives and encouragement, that's all great for the chat. And uh, the Q&A is best for questions that you want to see addressed. Um, Aubrey has just dropped a link into the chat to a Google Doc with some PowerPoint slides that um, you can follow along with if you want. We're not going to put them up tonight because we want you all to see Aubrey's delightful face. But if you're a visual person who wants to see the words on the screen, you can click that link and follow along as we go. We're also putting those slides up on our website, so they will be available after tonight's presentation if you want to view them then. If you want captions for tonight's a uh, keynote. You can turn them on and control the size of the captions by clicking on the little box at the bottom right of your screen that says CC live transcript. Um, if you have any questions or technical difficulties with any of this, you can go ahead and put that into the chat and somebody will, one of our staff members will help, or you can call the office 406 317-1505. That number is also going into the chat and someone will answer the phone and help you out. Um, we're recording today's session, so that recording will be available after we get done tonight. And at the end of tonight's session and with all of our workshops throughout WPLI, we are going to ask that you stay online and complete a short evaluation. We'll drop that link in the chat at the end of the session. And um, part of that evaluation includes an opportunity to enter your name into a raffle to win some prizes. Very excitingly, one of those prizes that's available is one of three signed copies of Aubrey Gordon's book, What We Don't Talk About When We Talk About Fat. So I encourage you to fill out those evaluations. We want to hear what you have to say. We read and pay very close attention to your feedback. And uh, that raffle prize is pretty fantastic. Finally, um, I want to take a second to thank our sponsors. Um, we couldn't put WPLI on even virtually without our sponsors. So I want to give a quick shout out to Montana Human Rights Network, Montana Budget and Policy Center, Montana Coalition Against Domestic and Sexual Violence, Forward Montana, Blue Mountain Clinic, Planned Parenthood of Montana, and the Women's Foundation of Montana. Thank you all for your sponsorship and support. 
So I am really, really excited tonight to introduce you to our keynote speaker, Aubrey Gordon. I'm going to give you Aubrey's sort of official bio in a minute, but before I do that, I'm going to take a little bit of uh, facilitator's privilege to say that introducing Aubrey is perhaps the most exciting thing that I get to do this year. Aubrey is whip smart, possibly one of the funniest people I know, and that's a high bar, and has enough integrity to last the whole year. And she's been doing some very important and necessary work that uh, the world has needed for a long time. And that work is made even more important and also difficult by the fact that Aubrey is one of just a handful of folks doing this work right now. So we are really thrilled and honored to have Aubrey uh, sharing some of her time with us here tonight. Um, I'm gonna give you the official bio now. Aubrey Gordon started writing as Your Fat Friend in 2016. She published, published exclusively under that pseudonym for four years, writing anonymously about the social and cultural realities of moving through the world as a very fat person. Her work has been published in Literary Hub, The New York Times, Vox, Self, Health, Roxanne Gay's Unruly Bodies, and Jamila Jamil's Highway. Her work has been covered by NPR, The Washington Post, The New York Times, and more, including, of course, Montana Women Vote. And her debut book, What We Don't Talk About When We Talk About Fat, was released by Beacon Press in November 2020. That's a must read. Today, she co-hosts the podcast Maintenance Phase with Michael Hobbs, in which the two debunk and decode wellness and weight loss trends. Aubrey lives in Portland, Oregon with her dog, Finn Diesel. And prior to working as an author and podcaster, she spent 12 years as a community organizer focused on queer and trans justice, immigrant rights, and voting rights. So without any further ado, um, it is my pleasure to welcome Aubrey Gordon. Hey, well, I can unmute myself, but I can't start my own video. <laughs> That's why I just found out. Hang on. <laughs> Goodness gracious. You get to experience me in the manner in which you are accustomed if you've heard the podcast, which is voice only. Oh, hang on, let me see if I can do it now. Yay, there we go. That's me. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for like the world's loveliest introduction, Howell. It's so good to see you. I've been practicing. Welcome. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Delightful. Um, for folks who don't know, and I don't know how you would, uh, Howell and I have known each other for, I think it's like a decade. Has it been longer than that? About longer that? Than that? Longer than that. So Howell was my like, uh, like organizing mentor sort of person at Western States. Yes, buddy. You don't roll your eyes at me. I'll fight you. No. <laughs> um, so we go way back and Howell has been like an incredible sort of shaping force in my organizing life for a really long time. And uh, I almost always say no to talking to people, <laughs> but I say yes to Howell. So I'm here. Hi. Thanks, buddy. Thank you uh, so much for being here. I'm going to close my video now. Okay. It's all you until questions. The okay, mutual great. love fest. It's the best for me, but you know, we'll just do that for an hour friends. and a half. How about all that? You. <laughs> my talk tonight is about how much I like Howell. <laughs> no. Um, well, like I say, thank you all so much for, for taking the time. Huge thanks to Montana Women Vote um, for, uh, for having me tonight. Um, my name is Aubrey Gordon, um, as you know. Um, you all uh, may, if you know me, if you know me, which, you know, who knows? Um, <laughs> you know me from either um, my book, What We Don't Talk About When We Talk About Fat, um, which is sort of looking at the systemic and structural um, ways that fat folks are marginalized in institutions um, and individually, um, or from my writing before that as your fat friend, or currently I co-host a podcast called Maintenance Phase, where we look at extremely wacky uh, diet and wellness trends like celery juice, which I learned through researching for the podcast, um, is uh, the recommendation of a ghost from the future. 
So not doctors, just in case you're drinking celery juice. <laughs> Heads up. <laughs> um, before I did that work, that's pretty recent in my life. I spent about a dozen years um, organizing predominantly in queer and trans communities, advocating for healthcare, particularly healthcare for trans folks, um, non-discrimination for LGBTQ folks, um, and voting rights. And I wanted to start out by talking about one of those moments in organizing that really ended up being kind of a flashpoint moment for me, um, which is um, about, God, I don't know how long ago it would have been now, six or seven years ago, um, we were uh, working on a campaign to require private insurers in the state of Oregon to cover transition-related health care, so services like mastectomies and hormones and like any number of surgeries and treatments that are provided to cis people regularly but were being denied to trans people just because they were trans and just because it was transition-related. Um, and we had a series of you know, city council meetings and meetings with HR folks, a bunch of uh, a bunch of uh, sort of decision making bodies with which you all will be familiar. Um, and we went into one of those meetings, and this happened quite a few times. We went into one of those meetings um, with a labor management committee for a municipality, um, and it was a room full of thin folks, almost exclusive excuse me, almost exclusively white folks um, and entirely cis people um, who were making decisions about whether or not to cover transition related health care. Um, and what happened then is what happened for us reliably, which was it almost immediately got reflect, refracted. Oof, boy, my words tonight. Um, <laughs> uh, it almost immediately got sort of refracted through this prism of um, well, it's cosmetic, so why should we cover it? And if we're covering cosmetic things, why shouldn't we cover weight loss surgery first? So we had gone in with a very specific request about transition-related care and about sort of ending this discriminatory practice of providing services for some people, but not for others. Um, and because I was sitting on the panel and because I was one of the folks in that room, um, it almost immediately turned into a conversation about fatness and about the sort of purported health risks of being a fat person. Um, and no matter how many times my colleagues and I redirected them to commanding data showing that this was life-saving care, um, no matter how many times we told them, we're not actually here to talk to you about bariatric surgery, it's not something we're prepared to speak on, and it's not a thing that we're advocating for, um, their responses reliably steered back to how to make fat people thin. It was a really bizarre experience, and that was one of many rooms in which that happened. Um, and their response illustrated a few different things for me. One, of course, it just illustrated like, oh, they're real focused on my body, right? As folks were um, saying these things, they were overwhelmingly addressing me directly. Um, two, that they were more interested in correcting fat bodies and making fat people thin. Um, than they were interested in giving trans people the life-saving health care they wanted and needed. So trans people were asking for something, fat people were not asking for something. <laughs> and the thing that these decision makers were reliably opting for was the thing that fat people were not opting, were not asking for, right? Um, it also became clear to me that their perceptions of my body and their biases around it were a barrier to their understanding of trans healthcare, which they were already struggling with, right? Um, they were not able to have a conversation about healthcare policy with someone who looked like me. Uh, and I think the hardest part of this sort of series of realizations was that, um, you know, as an advocate and as someone who had dedicated so much time and energy alongside so many uh, trans community leaders and so many colleagues of mine, um, it was a real bitter pill to swallow that um, for this group of people, my body was a barrier to them understanding and buying into the issue that we were talking about. Um, and 
it suggested to me that they would likely have a hard time talking with anybody who looked like me about anything other than being fat. It was all they could seem to think about. Um, and that was one of a lot of ways that being a fat person and sort of anti-fat bias showed up in organizing world for me. It showed up in going to allied organizations rallies where everyone was expected to wear a t-shirt and the largest size was a large or XL, which is not going to work for old fatty over here. <laughs> um, uh, it showed up in the policies that we advocated for. Basically, if uh, if organizers could claim that a policy would address the obesity epidemic, they would. And that um, was true of conservative folks. It was true of progressive folks. It was true sort of across the political spectrum um, that folks were arguing um, that all manner of policies from school funding to, you know, parks to to any number of things could be a solution for the obesity epidemic. And that was a quick ticket to some level of political credibility, right? Um, it showed up in advocacy when fat people had testimonies and those testimonies would be quietly sidelined, right? Um, and it showed up in casual conversations when other queer women like me would argue that fat queer people should not be uh, included as part of the face of the LGBTQ movement. Um, because as one of them told me, some of us do care about our health and our appearance. Uh, I don't know if you're seeing my eyeshadow. I care about my appearance. How dare you? <laughs> um, so that was just one of many, many, many ways that anti-fatness sort of showed up in organizing world. But in order to sort of back up a little bit and give you all some context, I wanted to talk a little bit about what anti-fatness is and a little bit about sort of the words that I'm gonna to use tonight. The first one that I've already started using um, and that I will keep using is the word fat. It's a word that um, carries a lot of meaning for a lot of people, um, some of it good and empowering and some of it really shameful and hard. Um, if you don't wanna use it, you don't have to use it. That's totally fine. Um, I'm gonna be using it um, in the spirit of uh, myself and many other fat activists who um, seek to reclaim that term um, as a neutral descriptor used to describe predominantly plus-sized people. Um, fat is something that we have laden with a lot of social meanings. We use it interchangeably with uh, unattractive. We use it interchangeably with unlovable. We use it interchangeably with uh, slovenly or sloppy or unhygienic or unintelligent. We use fat as a stand-in for all of these other ideas about ways that people are. Um, and what I would argue is that fat is as neutral or can be as neutral as tall or short or blonde or brown-haired or any of those sorts of words. It is just a fact that I am a fat person. Drop me into any place at any time and people will be like, there's a fat lady. And they would be right and I would agree with them. <laughs> um, I will say I'm also specifically not going to be using the terms overweight and obese. Those are rooted in the body mass index, which is an outdated tool for identifying fatness in medical settings. It was actually never designed um, for use in medical settings. It was uh, invented by a mathematician, statistician, and astronomer who had no healthcare training and was very specific um, that it was only to be used at the population level for sort of statistics purposes. Um, not for individual health, but here we are using it for individual health. Look at that. Um, <clears throat> it uh, also has never been tested on anyone who isn't white or East Asian at scale. Um, so it's a real racist tool on top of everything else. So heads up there. Um, on top of that, uh, the word obese in Latin literally means to eat oneself fat. So the blame is really built right into that term. Uh, and it's a term that a number of fat activists uh, consider to be um, derogatory, if not straight up just a slur. Um, at the very least, it just doesn't, you know, I've met one fat person who has said that it makes them feel like neutral and everyone else has said, it makes them feel real bad. Um, if it feels good to you, that's fine. Uh, but for many, many, many fat people, it does not. Um, so I'm gonna use fat, it's an affirming term for me. 
uh, and that'll be the language that I use tonight. Um, the other term that I'm going to use quite a bit is um, anti-fatness um, or anti-fat bias. That is the attitudes, behaviors, and social systems that specifically marginalize, exclude, and underserve fat bodies. Um, some folks call this fat phobia is a term you might have heard. Uh, I don't tend to use that term because uh, mental health advocates and mad pride activists um, have been really clear that uh, fat phobia uh, isn't a phobia. Phobias are real things. They're real mental health conditions. Uh, and they're not the same thing as bigotry or as bias. Um, so I'm going to just use anti-fatness because it feels a little more neutral and I don't need to step on anybody else's toes. That seems not good. Um, I also don't use the term sizeism. That's another one that folks will use um, because it is so readily and easily redirected toward a perceived sort of discrimination against thin people. Um, and I really want to keep the focus on fat people here. Uh, these conversations get derailed real easily. So anti-fatness it is. Um, from there, I have a couple of questions for you. Um, these are a couple of questions that are used often in uh, academic surveys about fatness and fat people. And I think Zuri or Howell has those ready to go. Yeah, there it is. Um, so the first question, and again, these are this is the academic language. I'm going to leave it undisturbed. Um, first question is, obesity is usually caused by overeating. Uh, you can select strongly disagree, somewhat disagree, somewhat agree, and strongly agree. And uh, my request here would be that folks answer honestly in your heart of hearts, not what you think the right answer is. Just like, what do you really believe when you see a fat person? How do you think they got fat? I'm gonna give folks just a minute. All right, looks like we've got mostly disagrees here. Uh, <laughs> uh, we are at about 52% strongly disagree, 37% somewhat disagree, and 11% somewhat agree. Uh, there's another question that I'm gonna ask you all, and then we'll sort of unpack, uh, you know, uh, what happens next. <laughs> uh, the next question is, obesity is caused by a lack of willpower. Same options, strongly, somewhat, somewhat, and strongly. All right, everybody. They're coming in. I'm going to give you all a second. I'm going to take a sip of sparkling water. Okay, looks like we're about good to go. Um, we've got 79% uh, strongly disagree, 16% somewhat disagree, 4% uh, somewhat agree, and no strongly agree. Thanks everybody, appreciate it. <laughs> um, so these are questions that are taken from uh, a survey called the Attitudes Toward Obese Persons Questionnaire, not my favorite title, um, but it is used as a way of measuring anti-fat bias because um, these two questions tend to be a pretty decent indicator. They're part of a larger set of questions. I cherry picked a couple of them because I didn't want to keep you all here all night just answering Zoom polls like a bunch of chumps. I wouldn't do that to you. Um, so these questions are a decent indicator of, um, you know, how folks think about fat people and particularly um, to what degree they're biased against fat people. So one of the groundwork sort of foundational beliefs in anti-fat bias is that uh, our bodies, the size and shape of our bodies is primarily or exclusively uh, under our control. And simply put, it is not. 
Um, scientifically, we know that there are over 60 kinds of obesity that researchers have uh, pinpointed. They all have different causes, contributors. They all have different treatments. Um, this is an incredibly complex question of how and why and whether fat people get fat and stay fat or some fat people stop being fat and start being thin. We don't actually totally know why that happens, but culturally we have gotten really hung up on this very specific um, uh, idea that fatness is a direct reflection of our character, of our work ethic, of our ability to say no, of our sort of puritanical work, work ethic, right? Protestant work ethic. Um, and of our ability to like resist temptation, uh, fatness becomes sort of collapsed into gluttony and sloth and other deadly sins, right? It's not great. Um, so I'm gonna close this out of poll questions. Thanks for doing that, everybody. Um, so as we're talking about anti-fatness, it's also really important to talk about, um, especially currently, um, anti-fatness, anti-fat bias is currently in the process of changing its clothes. Diets are currently in the process of changing their clothes. Um, and uh, the sort of going concern these days is for fat people is, but what about your health? So I wanted to talk a little bit about a concept um, that was and a term that was coined uh, by uh, Robert Crawford in 1980. And that term is healthism. Healthism is sort of a facet of ableism or sort of uh, attitudes, discriminatory attitudes and behaviors toward disabled people. Um, it is a concept that reinforces many other systems of oppression. And Crawford defined healthism as, and I'll, I'll just read off this quote for you, quote, a preoccupation with personal health as a primary and often the primary focus for the definition and achievement of well-being. By elevating health to a super value, a metaphor for all that is good in life, healthism reinforces the privatization of the struggle for generalized well being. So, healthism is a way that we look with laser like focus just at the individual as the source and determinant of their own health. And what we know, what the CDC knows, what many health advocates know, what many anti-poverty advocates know, what many anti-racist advocates know, is that health is overwhelmingly determined by things that are outside of our control. They're, it's determined by things like our access to healthcare. Do we have health insurance? Can we see doctors? If we can see doctors, are those doctors who will respect our cultural traditions, our identities, our bodies? Uh, are they folks who will give us what they what we need? Um, our health is also determined by things like uh, what researchers term minority stress, which is essentially the stress of living in a racist world for Black people, Indigenous people, and people of color, right? Um, we also know that health is formed by things like what zip code you grow up in. Uh, what's the built environment like there? Do you have access to parks? Do you have access to clean air? Do you have access to clean water, right? Like all of these things form our health and our individual behaviors account for a very, very small slice of that pie. Um, and yet our sort of cultural conceptions of health are really relentlessly focused on individual behaviors, despite a preponderance of evidence that suggests that those are some of the smallest factors that we can influence with respect to our own health. And I will also say on top of all of that, like there are many people who just aren't ever going to meet a mainstream definition of healthy. People who have dealt with or are currently dealing with addiction, people who have eating disorders may or may not ever be perfectly healthy. Fat people may or may not ever be perfectly healthy. Those are all people who still deserve to be thought of as good and decent and thoughtful people. Those are all people who still deserve health care. They deserve to stay alive. <laughs> they deserve a high quality of life. So I just want to name that that sort of what about your health stuff isn't apart from bias. It isn't separate from it. It is absolutely at the core of uh, quite a few of our biases against um, fat people and disabled people and BIPOC and so many other marginalized communities, right? Um, I will also say on this note, uh, 
Deshaun Harrison, who is an absolutely brilliant theorist and uh, a, a good colleague and friend of mine, um, argues that health as a social construct was actually designed to exclude Black folks, right? Um, it is. Uh, it has been defined time and time and time again based on research that was only conducted on white people. And even if it included some people of color, it definitely didn't include Black or Indigenous people. Um, so I think there's also a conversation to have there about like who's defining what is healthy and to what end? And what does it mean when health stops being a matter of science and individual care or community care and starts being a point that we use to individually assess someone's character. Um, if we're gonna talk about anti-fatness, we also have to talk about sort of its roots. Um, anti-fatness has its roots, perhaps its deepest sort of tap roots in white supremacy and particularly anti-blackness, right? Um, that uh, anti-fatness really experienced this huge boom. There's a phenomenal book about this called Fearing the Black Body by Sabrina Strings, who's a sociologist uh, out of the UC system in California, um, who talks about sort of how uh, following the Civil War and following the end of slavery uh, and the practice of enslavement, um, that differentiating between white bodies and black bodies became a political project as a way of illustrating the continued superiority and supremacy of white folks over black folks and anyone who wasn't white, right? Um, it's also worth noting that um, bodybuilding and fitness and thinness were uh, major priorities in the Third Reich, right? Like at the risk of dropping all kinds of gnarly stuff on you all. Hi, sorry. Um, you know, this has long, long, long been a project of uh, sort of racist thinking, white supremacist thinking, and anti-Semitic thinking. Um, it is also very clearly the product of both misogyny and sort of gender policing writ large, right? Um, there are a number of brilliant theorists, um, including my friend Keevan Bay, who's written about how fat sort of ungenders a body um, and fat people are desexualized or hypersexualized both, right? Um, and that shows up in particularly stark ways with uh, fat women and fat trans folks. Um, Anti-fatness has its roots fundamentally in ableism as we just discussed with healthism. Um, it has its roots also in classism. Uh, Paul Campos, who's another really thoughtful person on fat stuff, um, has written about how anti-fatness sort of had this really sharp rise in the late 20th century, just as amongst sort of polite company, amongst middle class and upper middle class white folks, it became unpopular to be overtly racist or overtly classist, that fatness became just a sort of thinly veiled way of talking about um, how folks felt about uh, poor folks and how folks felt about um, people of color. Uh, and of course, of course, if you've listened to our podcast, you know this, uh, it has deep, deep, deep roots in capitalism because if you posed your own body as a problem, then somebody's gonna be able to sell you a solution to the problem of your body. Congratulations, there's a whole industry, it's worth billions of dollars. Um, and I think the last thing I would say about anti-fatness, and this is the thing that can be like a little bit of a hard sell for folks, and it continues to be a bitter pill for me to swallow, um, is that it is perpetuated like so many systems of oppression. It is perpetuated by all of us, right? It's perpetuated in big ways and small ways by just about every one of us. Big ways like, uh, you know, mocking and uh, making memes out of fat people. Big ways like uh, complaining about having to sit next to a fat person on an airplane. Um, and small ways like complimenting someone's weight loss, especially if you don't know the story behind that weight loss, because it pretty clearly uh, implies that a thinner body, even without knowing the story of how that body became thinner, is inherently better than a fatter body, right? Um, Anti-fatness can show up internally. Um, it can show up, uh, I would say, intrapersonally, so just within yourself as bad body image or negative self-talk. 
Um, it can show up as just sort of thoughts about fat people. Like you see a person who's fatter than you, you go, hmm, at least I'm not that fat. Like, whoops, sorry team, that's anti-fatness. It's not great. Um, <laughs> it can show up interpersonally. So between folks uh, with things like fat shaming, um, diet talk without asking for someone's consent first uh, can be, uh, first of all, like very deeply triggering for people with eating disorders, right? Um, but also just like pretty deeply insulting to fat people to hear people around them and particularly thinner people talk about the lengths that they will go to not to look like us is like, you know, doesn't feel great. Um, it shows up as unsolicited advice. So diet advice, uh, offering to be somebody's workout buddy if they, you've never heard them talk about working out before, <laughs> never heard them ask about wanting a buddy. Um, and it can show up as something called concern trolling, which is, um, we touched on that briefly earlier. Uh, concern trolling is sort of the idea that someone can express concern uh, and that, that will shield them from being understood as being biased in any way. And actually what we know about concern trolling is that fat people experience that as extremely intense anti-fat bias. So when folks say, I'm not mad, I'm not judging you, I'm just concerned about your health. That to me personally is not an indicator of a lack of bias. It's not an indicator of genuine care, although the person on the other end may feel genuine care. It is an indicator that that person sees a fat body and thinks I'm going to die. <laughs> and also that they see a fat body and they feel like their thin body is an accomplishment and they have this sort of noblesse oblige, this like obligation to help me through my own wretchedness of being fat and come into the light of thinness, right? Uh, it's not great. And it's really complicated. Those folks can, again, genuinely feel concern, genuinely feel that way. And that concern is also genuinely rooted in anti-fatness, right? Um, anti-fatness can also show up culturally. Um, it will show up in things like, well, before we get into culturally, I will say that stuff about uh, sort of internal, your internal life of anti-fatness and your interpersonal one-on-one -on -one life with other people around anti-fatness is usually where our conversations about fatness and anti-fatness begin and end. We just think of it as something that's either in your head or it's a one-on-one -on -one interaction with sort of a bad apple. Um, but we don't tend to talk about how it shows up culturally or institutionally. And uh, that's where the smaller stuff comes from, right? Is larger cultural messages, larger institutional practices uh, that make it okay to discuss fat people's bodies openly, to make jokes about fat people, to complain about having to sit next to a fat person on a plane without really thinking about how that might be the trigger for the flight crew to kick that fat person off of the plane, right? Um, that uh, sort of cultural and institutional stuff is really foundational and it's the stuff we talk about the least, generally speaking. So culturally anti-fatness can show up uh, on the evening news if you've ever watched uh, any kind of like local or national news stories about the obesity epidemic. Um, you will see this footage of fat people milling around in public usually shot from their neck to about their knee, um, just fat torsos, just rolls. If they can get a shot of a sweaty fat person or a fat person holding fast food or better yet, taking a bite out of fast food, that's what they'll do. That is extraordinarily stigmatizing and overtly dehumanizing footage. Uh, it is usually taken without the subject's knowledge or consent and it is specifically like highlighting these, the most reductive assumptions that we make about fat people, right? Constantly sort of shoveling food into our faces, sweaty, gross, you don't wanna be around us, all of that sort of stuff. Um, Anti-fatness shows up culturally in entertainment and shows like The Biggest Loser or My 600 Pound Life, uh, or most recently Jonathan Van Ness's show. Uh, I have not seen it, but have heard a lot from a lot of other fat folks about like just a lot of really rough obesity epidemic messaging. Um, it shows up in our responses to celebrity weight loss and gain. 
um, that there are reliably tabloid stories about like the horrors of weight gain for some celebrities and that celebrity weight loss, including I would say most recently uh, Adele's weight loss um, was met in the absence of any narrative from her for months and months and months, uh, the comments in on her Instagram and the sort of media narrative was good for her. She's doing what she needs to do to be around for her son. As if being, I don't know what size Adele is, but you know, she was, she was on the small end of plus size. Uh, as if that was an immediate cause for death, as if she was going to have been abandoning her son by being a fat person. It's really rough. Um, it shows up culturally in that you can go into pretty much any store and find straight sizes. So sizes that are smaller than plus sizes, um, despite the fact that a majority of Americans wear plus sizes, it's very difficult to find our clothes and they're usually sold in an upcharge. Um, and it shows up culturally in attacking our political opponents based on their size rather than their policies, practices, attitudes actions, any of that kind of stuff. I think this one showed up in a particularly heartbreaking way for me uh, during the Trump administration uh, when so many of my friends and family, rather than or in addition to tackling Donald Trump's uh, racism, xenophobia, warmongering, I mean, really take your pick, uh, that the things that they went for were shots of his butt looking big or jokes about him eating fast food or jokes about how he was gonna die or any of that sort of stuff, die as a result of being fat, right? Um, <clears throat> rather than thinking, you know, this is maybe one of the worst guys I've seen in a while and maybe that's enough. Maybe we don't need to also go, and he's fat. <laughs> like maybe that's not totally necessary. Uh, ditto Chris Christie, ditto Mike Huckabee, ditto Sarah Huckabee Sanders. There are plenty of examples of this. Ditto Bill Clinton, ditto so many people. Um, so that's a little bit about cultural anti-fatness. I wanted to move on and talk a little bit about how anti-fatness shows up in institutions. So um, in doing this work, when I talk to folks about the kinds of discrimination that fat people face, many, many people believe uh, that uh, discrimination on the basis of body size is against the law in the United States. It is not. Uh, it is only against the law in two states. Those states are Michigan and Washington. I am in a state with no protections on the basis of uh, weight uh, or size or shape discrimination. You all are based in a state with no protection. I feel like that's probably not gonna surprise you all. No protections on the basis of uh, size or shape, right? Um, it's just Washington and Michigan and the city and county of San Francisco doing its part, San Francisco. Um, so it's worth knowing that you know, in both of our states, I'm in Oregon, uh, I could apply for a job and someone could tell me with a straight face, you're not getting this job because you're fat. And I would have no legal recourse. That's what that means. No legal recourse for fat folks and no accountability um, for anyone who sort of perpetrates that kind of discrimination, right? Um, Anti-fatness also shows up institutionally in healthcare. Um, it shows up amongst healthcare providers in the sort of stereotyping of fat patients. Um, I have a, uh, a good friend, this is deeply stigmatizing language, I'm so sorry everybody. Um, I have a good friend whose uh, wife is a, uh, is a surgeon um, and has uh, repeatedly told me about colleagues of hers who refer to fat people as Hondas, um, which is an acronym uh, for hypertensive, obese, uh, non-compliant, diabetic, and then the A uh, usually means alcoholic, um, sometimes means a-hole, depending on who you ask. Um, <clears throat> many, many, many healthcare providers, more than half 
um, describe fat patients as lazy, weak-willed, non-compliant, and unattractive, to which I say, I'm not trying to date my doctor. I really just need you to give me some like baseline blood work, like check out my elbow, it's doing a weird thing. Um, and uh, there are some, there's some research into uh, nurses and nursing students who um, uh, a pretty significant chunk of uh, believe that they shouldn't be required to provide health care to fat people. And that if they are fat people who enter a uh, hospital for any medical reason should be put on a very low calorie diet of under 500 calories a day. Um, while you're in the hospital, presumably recovering from like some really gnarly illness, the solution here is also you should have, I don't know, less than 20% of your caloric needs for the day. Great. Um, there's also quite a bit of research that shows this doesn't just show up in attitudes, it also shows up in practices. Fat people usually get office visits that are about one third to one half the length of thin people. Uh, Healthcare providers develop less emotional rapport and are less likely to order tests um, or to take additional diagnostic steps that they might take with thinner patients. Um, as a result of that, many, many, many fat people have really gnarly stories about misdiagnosis or outright refusal of care. Uh, I absolutely have had doctors who have looked at me and refused to treat me, um, and that is a thing that's worth talking about. There are also um, uh, a handful of uh, healthcare providers. This is not the predominant practice, uh, but there are examples of this. And it is a legal thing that people decide to do um, who will uh, decide to set weight limits on the patients that they will see, right? Um, it also shows up in the public health and research approaches that we use to address the sort of quote unquote health problem of fatness. Um, our interventions are overwhelmingly based in judgment, not in data. So uh, there was a billboard campaign out of Georgia a little over 10 years ago called Strong for Life that included photos of fat kids uh, and captions that say things like, warning, big bones didn't make me this way, big meals did. And Warning, chubby kids may not outlive their parents. There is, in those campaigns, no regard for what it would feel like as a fat kid to see those billboards. There is no regard for what it would feel like as a parent to a fat kid or a fat parent of a kid to see signs like that. There is no consideration of what it means to uh, dangle someone's mortality as an I told you so, um, it's really grotesque human behavior as far as I'm concerned. It's, it's, I find it really deeply upsetting. Um, and I would say, you know, for the podcast, Michael and I, and for my writing, um, we both read just astonishing numbers <laughs> of studies about fatness and fat people. And I can count on one hand the number of studies about fat people's health that have even considered that anti-fatness might be a factor, that there might be stress from living in a world that hates fat people as much as this one does, um, that the doctors or researchers designing a study or providing health care might actually be a factor in fat folks' mortality, right? It might not be that our bodies are inherently trying to kill us. It might be that healthcare providers who don't pay quite enough attention and don't give us the same level of trust and care that they give to thinner people could be a contributor to our mortality rates, right? Um, and also those mortality rates are not good. I don't, I don't recommend paying attention to those. <laughs> um, I will also say it shows up in uh, how fat people are scapegoated for a for-profit healthcare system, right? That the rising costs of healthcare are overwhelmingly blamed on fat people and particularly diabetic people who are also assumed to be fat, um, rather than on private corporations who are deciding what to charge all of us and government that refuses to regulate those private corporations, right? There are other answers here, but instead we drive toward scapegoating a, a group of folks who already have limited access, right? And finally, I would say 
um, anti-fatness shows up in healthcare around uh, access to surgery, around access to transition-related healthcare in particular. We don't have non-surgical evidence-based treatments that lead to weight loss, but still trans people are required to lose weight, fat trans people in particular. Um, that number can vary from, uh, from healthcare provider to healthcare provider. They're allowed to set their own limits. Uh, and uh, folks will be denied if they're not able to lose enough weight quickly enough. Um, and that means uh, that uh, folks are just stuck for years often without the healthcare that they need. Um, but if those same people would like to get weight loss surgery, surprise, we can make that happen. We can't uh, put you under the knife for the thing that you want, but we can put you under the knife for the thing that we want, right? Um, a couple more quick littles. <laughs> um, you know, anti fatness also shows up in public assistance. It shows up in what we cover uh, in SNAP on food stamps. Um, it shows up in education in sending out BMI report cards to parents who overwhelmingly don't actually believe their kids' BMI report cards and there's no real follow-up. So what are we doing there? Just sending home a letter saying your kid's fat, bye. Um, it shows up in employment. It shows up in what's called a fat tax, which is the upcharge for fat people's clothing and transportation and any number of things. Um, and finally, and perhaps most heartbreakingly, um, anti-fatness shows up uh, as a way of reinforcing and justifying violence against many, many marginalized communities, most notably and most recently uh, in the Black Lives Matter movement and the killing of uh, Eric Garner, um, the New York Police Association genuinely argued uh, <clears throat> that they should not be held to account for the videotaped uh, murder of uh, Eric Garner because their argument was he was fat and he was going to die anyway. Their language was a bear hug could have killed him. Um, that was their defense for that. Uh, I find it morally repugnant. Um, so for all of these reasons, and honestly, like despite all of these reasons, many uh, organizations, many community organizers, many um, issues that uh, we all work on um, don't actually account for fat people as part of our base. We don't actually think about how to talk about fatness in a thoughtful way. Many of us sort of passively accept language around the obesity epidemic. Uh, many of us passively accept the sort of stigmatizing of fat folks that happen. So I wanted to close with talking to you all a little bit about what it looks like to take action for fat justice, both on an individual level, we'll start there, and then we'll talk about what it looks like to weave it into our organizing, um, which you all know uh, in this particular moment quite a bit better than I do. <laughs> um, on an individual level, it looks like centering consent, so asking for consent before diving into talking about your diet or the things you don't like about your body. Again, Many, many, many people, um, some estimates put it at about one in four uh, people in the US have diagnosed or undiagnosed eating disorders. So you really don't know whose eating disorder you're, you know, what sort of trip wires you're landing on, right? Um, and again, for fat folks, it's like pretty, uh, can be pretty upsetting. It isn't across the board, but it can be um, to hear someone who's say half my size talk about how no one will ever love them because they're fat, right? Like that can be a real and genuine feeling for them. And it can also be not one that I'm the best audience for, right? Um, it looks like interrupting anti-fatness every time you hear it and defending fat people, even when we're not there, right? Even when there are no fat people around, somebody makes a fat joke, say something about that fat joke. Somebody points at a fat person and says they shouldn't be wearing that, or I would never date this person or whatever. Like say something to that person. Um, the problem here isn't saying exactly the right thing. The problem here is that most people don't say or do anything, right? Um, and it looks like in your, uh, in your jobs, if you're a person who has a job, taking on workplace wellness programs um, that give bonuses for healthy BMIs and are a way of paying thin people, people for being thin and penalizing fat people for being fat um, and taking on sort of biggest loser competitions that gamify weight loss, um, which again, 
we just know the overwhelming majority of weight loss efforts um, end uh, with regaining more weight than you had to start with. So let's not, even if you call it a lifestyle change, even if you call it a cleanse, it's all the same. <laughs> um, in terms of organizing, uh, what it looks like to sort of take action for fat justice or some ways that you can, this is not an exhaustive list. These are kind of gimmies. This is the low hanging fruit. One is, just don't use any messaging about the obesity epidemic. If you're going to figure out how to message to challenge it, but definitely don't uh, agree to uh, stigmatizing messaging about the obesity epidemic or propose that your policies are going to fix it. Uh, fat people are here. We have always been here. Uh, and uh, no matter what sort of public health interventions we decide to take, no matter how much stigma we decide to pile on, there will always be fat people. And yet still, public health interventions proudly hold up the healthiest world as the one with no fat people in it, which is not a world that has ever existed, right? Um, it also looks like naming fat people in your work, being explicit about the impacts of your work on fat people. Even if you don't say it externally, which, you know, maybe you will, maybe you won't, checking in with yourself about like, okay, when we're saying and doing these things, what would the effects be on fatter folks? Okay, we're holding this event. <laughs> Who's it built for, right? Okay, we're talking about healthcare. How can we do that in a way that welcomes in fat people rather than holds us off, right? <laughs> Sorry, I have a speaker in the other room that thought I was talking to it, and I'm not. I'm talking to you guys. <laughs> um, you can screen for candidates' anti-fatness and candidate questionnaires uh, and any number of other um, tools that you use, uh, candidate forums. Um, you can ask them questions about their attitudes toward fat people and fatness um, and sort of weave that into other candidate screening that you do. You can focus on attacking folks' policies and politics, not their bodies. I just gotta say, uh, the size and shape of someone's body cannot, cannot be a reason for that person to hold office or not to hold office. That does not go on your resume. That is not a skill. That is not a practice. And frankly, it's something that most of us don't have control over. So it absolutely should not be a reason for an ad hominem attack. Um, make the movement accessible, make sure that you've got chairs around that don't have arms on them, right? So that fat people can sit at your event without leaving with bruises on our legs or our sides, right? Um, and you can publicly oppose anti-fatness, even and especially when it shows up amongst people who you politically agree with. Uh, that was a lot of information. It was more than I thought I was going to have. <laughs> Um, but I wanted to uh, sort of leave it there, leave it on action. This is a, a Zoom room full of organizers. Um, so uh, I wanted to open up sp some space to think about how to sort of, not just how to think about this stuff, but how to operationalize it in your work. Um, and from there, I think I might just open it up to take some questions. Howell, what do you think, bud? Welcome back. There, Hi. there are questions pouring in. So I'm just, I'm going to start uh, reading them out to you. Great. Let's do it, bud. All right. First question. Um, interested in your thoughts about the interplay of anti-fat bias and the dialogue around access to healthy food, food deserts, agriculture. Mm -hmm. And this is framed as uh, we tend to veer into poor folks should get more public assistance so they don't eat fast food for every meal versus everyone deserves whatever food they want as a human right. And there is a PS on this, as a fat lady, thank you for your work. Let's start oh. with question. Hi, fellow fat lady. Welcome. Hi, buddy. <laughs> uh, this is a really complicated question. And I'm so glad you asked it. Uh, I feel like I have a bunch of like semi-formed thoughts about this. And then if other folks have thoughts, like chime on in, howl, buddy jump on in whenever you like. <laughs> um, uh, I would say that there are a number of challenges with our conversations about food access. One is that, like if we take the conversation about school lunches as a starter, right? Um, the conversation about school lunches in terms of the public sort of uh, mainstream conversation, not the policy conversations that are a little more nuts and bolts. The public media conversation is, how do we use school lunches to make kids lose weight? It's not, 
how do we increase the number of vitamins and minerals in school foods? It's not, how do we ensure that kids are getting nutritious food and being fed regularly? How do we make sure that every kid who's going to public school has three square meals a day? Uh, and I will say, it is also a conversation that is just drenched in and saturated in whiteness and white judgment of foods that are not foods that white people usually eat, right? The sort of healthy foods that we think about are A, frankly, real bland. <laughs> and second of all, uh, are like very overtly racialized, right? Nutritionally, uh, kale and collard greens have really similar sort of nutritional profiles, but one of those is held up as healthy and one of those is held up as unhealthy. And uh, if you guessed the one that is more associated with Black Americans is the unhealthy one, you guessed right, Dean. Um, I would say we have a long way to go in our conversations about food access. And what I would love to see in those conversations is uh, like less to almost none, frankly, conversations about weight loss um, and more conversations about hunger and poverty, which are the drivers of like, the reasons that people go to drive throughs are both like they like the food and it tastes good or whatever, but also, hey man, you're working multiple jobs. You got mouths to feed. You don't have time to do all this meal prep. You don't have time or access to food. Uh, I was telling someone the other day that a dear friend of mine who passed recently uh, at the time that she passed was on SNAP and her monthly allocation of food stamps was $16. Like how a person is meant to survive on $16 is a much larger public health issue than like food deserts or fast food or blah, 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 blah. like we got to be real that we're not actually paying people enough. We're not enough willing to allow low income people to eat uh, that we are driving folks into uh, worse health outcomes and more stigma at the same time. So like, what would it look like to focus on better health outcomes and less stigma is what I would say about that conversation. How you live there, you, you live in food access and social safety net programs. What would you, what am I missing here? Tell me what I'm missing, bud. Uh, I don't think you're missing anything. I think that's exactly right. I think that, um, you know, one of the challenges with looking at food deserts is exactly what you named earlier, that there is a capitalism at the heart of this, that food deserts exist where um, people don't have enough resources and money to maintain grocery stores, to make it worth it for uh, food distributors to drive their fresh produce truck through. And that if we, instead of looking at what are people eating individually, what's on your plate, what's in your fridge, instead we looked at, do people have enough money to live on? We would end up likely at a, a better solution. More people have more money, they have more money to spend in their communities and the communities end up with the services and resources that they need. But again, it's that healthism, it's the focus on the personal responsibility, the individual behavior instead of the overall capitalist systems. And, you know, folks on this webinar know this, that I would love even if we could just get to a place in, for instance, the Montana State Legislature of talking about, let's get poor folks more public assistance so that they can eat whatever they want, instead of the conversation that we've been having session after session, which is how can we limit what people are allowed to buy with SNAP because folks are buying candy and energy drinks and they're shopping at the gas station instead of the grocery store. So we're a long way from being where we need to be. And, and you know, it is, it feels like um, such important work that we continue to push that conversation forward. Yeah, I would also, I'm gonna add one, one more thing that just occurred to me while you were talking about, all of these are such good points, Hell, All of them are such good points. And uh, I would say at a much higher level, before we get down into individual choices, we are making macro level decisions about what crops to subsidize and what corporations to support. 
Um, so we have made decisions to subsidize corn and wheat and soy, right? Which are sort of um, baseline ingredients that have been stigmatized in big ways. Uh, we haven't made the decision to subsidize broccoli or greens <laughs> or any number of uh, other foods. Um, and we have made, again, like public assistance programs, both so Byzantine and hard to navigate, but also so deeply paternalistic and stigmatizing, right? Like there is not a conversation about public assistance and particularly food access and public assistance that I have encountered that doesn't involve usually white folks, usually class privileged folks saying, I know your health better than you do. You can't be trusted to make your own decisions. I got to make them for you. So that's the other thing that I would say is it's just shot through with so much stigma and judgment that like, I think the first thing that I would like to do is just focus on peeling away the stigma and judgment and thinking about like, okay, on a systems level, in a more dispassionate way, what does it look like to make more nutritious foods accessible to more people? Absolutely, I agree. Um, I'm gonna give you another question from the Q&A. Um, I'm yes. taking these a little out of order because this is another sort of policy focused, systems focused question. And this is really about um, healthcare and healthcare providers. So the question is, first, what is Aubrey's next right thing for healthcare providers? Something folks can do, pri providers can do right mm -hmm. now to help when face-to-face -face with patients. Mm -hmm. And as a follow-up, what are further resources for healthcare providers who want to make both personal and systemic change? Well, okay. These are both great questions. <laughs> um, I would say, God, there are so many next right things. Uh, I would say the next right thing is to find a way to take into account uh, how your patients feel about conversations about weight before you start talking to them about weight and to limit those conversations to when they are diagnostically or in sort of in a treatment mode, um, like appropriate. When are they actually relevant? Um, I would say checking in with folks about what's your history with eating disorders? What's your history with weight stigma, right? Like how do you feel and behave in conversations about weight? Do you wanna talk about weight? I had a doctor, I will say, oh my goodness. And a doctor a few years ago for the first time who was like, hey, do you wanna, uh, we've got you down as having an obese, obesity class three BMI, which used to be called super morbidly obese, which I choose to believe means I'm a superhero of some sort. Uh, yeah, big thumbs down. <laughs> uh, and that doctor asked me uh, if I would like to talk about that. And I said, nope. And we moved on, the end. And we truly never talked about it again. The other thing I would say in terms of the next right thing is there are many, many, many guidelines that uh, suggest for many different conditions from polycystic ovarian syndrome to sort of pre-surgical care, all kinds of things that um, suggest weight loss as a treatment. I would say in that case, the onus is on the healthcare provider to make sure that they are recommending a treatment with more than a single digit success rate. And weight loss is not that. So like if your treatment is something that doesn't work for, you know, between 80 and 95% of people, depending on when you check in and what kind of methods you use, uh, then why would you recommend it <laughs> to patients, right? Like, and when is that appropriate? So I think doing some more thinking about the patient end of that conversation, um, because part of what can happen is that those conversations about weight loss can trigger folks eating disorders and can lead to uh, worse health outcomes instead of better health outcomes when we don't take that into account. That's what I would say on the patient end as a next right thing. What was the second part of the question? I forgot the second part of the question. <laughs> uh, further resources, bigger resources oh. for providers in making yes. personal and systemic change. Yes, yes. Um, so I would say do as much research, get on PubMed team, get on your old favorite research databases and do as much research into anti-fat bias in healthcare as you have done into weight loss and weight management in healthcare. That's what I would say is the number, like truly just 
just get on Google Scholar <laughs> and look into uh, look into anti-fatness and sort of how that shapes uh, patient outcomes, how that shapes uh, patients' relationships to healthcare, how that leads to years-long postponement of care. That's what I would say is like, don't look, for, like you, you're welcome to look for other sources. The National Association for the Advancement of Fat Acceptance, NAFA, has some resources, ASDA, the Association for Size, Diversity, and Health, uh, has resources for healthcare providers. Those are all good. I think the main thing that I would leave folks with is really take a hard and uncomfortable look at when anti-fatness shows up in healthcare, what are the impacts of that? Because it's not just a nice thing to do. It's not a thing that makes your patients feel better or whatever. In many cases, anti-fatness in healthcare is the difference between life and death. I can't tell you how many fat people I know and have spoken to who have gone in for really troubling symptoms like shortness of breath or shooting pains or whatever, and have been told that's just because you're fat and you're out of shape and you need to lose weight and come back when you've lost weight. And in some cases, those folks don't make it, right? That's not on the patient. The patient has done the appropriate thing of seeking healthcare when they're experiencing really troubling symptoms. That then is a question for the provider. Um, so that's what I would say. And, and also I will say there is some research, there's not a ton of research onto interventions into anti-fatness, but the little bit of research that does exist shows that something as small as showing a 15 minute video one time from the perspective of fat people or taking fat people's humanity into account can really do a significant job sort of shifting folks' perspectives on fat patients in healthcare settings. So I, really, again, I would just say like, the thing to do here is just like, try something. It doesn't have to be a perfect thing. It just has to be like doing anything. That's what I would say. Well, I only have one thing to add to that, which is mm, I also think me. providers should all be listening to maintenance phase, which <laughs> is an excellent, an excellent resource, not just for understanding um, all the utter tomfoolery that is sold to us as health and wellness, but also as a very good primer on how to properly do research. So everyone should for sure be getting on that as well. Sure. Uh, I hope those healthcare providers like swearing. <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't? I do a um, lot of it. Yeah. Next question. Um, what are your thoughts on body neutrality versus body positivity? Oh, uh, my thoughts are no thank you to both. Um, <laughs> uh, here's what I would say. Uh, I focus my work around fat justice and liberation for the most part. Um, and uh, I would say that body positivity has a long sort of circuitous route through history um, with sort of disputed roots as where as to where it or, or uh, boo, 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 where it originated. Those are words. Um, <laughs> uh, but it's pretty clear that in the last 10 to 15 years, it has been first co-opted by corporations as a way of messaging and selling products. And then as a result of that advertising has been flooded with thin folks who think of it as an apolitical movement, which historically it has not been. It has been very clearly a movement uh, surrounded around the justice and liberation of fat folks. It has very clearly been an anti-racist movement. It has very clearly been a lot of things like a disability justice movement. And what has happened over the course of the last, again, like a couple decades um, is that it has been really defanged and reinvented as this like, you do you girl boss get it, feel good about yourself, which are not unworthy goals, but they are definitely not the original goals of that movement. I think uh, many fat folks, myself included, no longer feel like we have a home in body positivity because so many of the thin folks who have more recently discovered it will say things like, I'm in favor of body positivity, but not, as, not if you're obese or like as long as you're healthy, right? And they will add these caveats that make it clear that they really are only talking about people who already exist within very restrictive health and beauty standards. Um, again, it is a totally fine and wonderful goal to feel neutral or positive about your own body. But if you do that and then close the door behind you, that's not really helping anybody else, right? Um, and it's not helping the folks who need it the most. 
so I would say though, neither of those are terms that I particularly agree with. Neither of them are bad goals to have in the world, but they're just spaces that have become, it feels like just as hostile to fat folks as anywhere else. Um, and I would say in both cases, uh, they are almost entirely focused on how you feel about your own body, um, which doesn't actually challenge anyone's biases about people who are fatter than them, right? Someone could totally identify as body positive and be really focused on making themselves feel better about their own bodies and also watch and love The Biggest Loser or My 600 Pound Life or whatever other like massively stigmatizing shows, right? You can change the way that you feel about your own body. That doesn't necessarily change the way that you treat or interact with people who are fatter than you. And it doesn't actually materialize in terms of any meaningful systemic or interpersonal change for fat folks. So I would say, unless there's some explicit addressing of anti-fat bias, which is overwhelming, uh, according to Harvard University, four out of five Americans have strong bias against fat people. Like, we got problems, team. So unless we take that on directly, can't just say, I feel better about my body, so problem solved, I'm out, right? <laughs> um, that's not actually movement building. It's good uh, self-esteem work to do, um, but it doesn't necessarily generate institutional change unless you decide to take it a few steps further, right? Sorry well, to be a bummer, team. <laughs> I'm, I'm flashing back to um, your answer to one of the questions about where's the good news uh, on, yeah. on maintenance phase, which is, well, yeah, sometimes there, we, we got to get through a lot of bad news first, yeah. so buckle up. Yeah. Um, I do have a couple questions. I'm going to combine these um, that are really a little more on the sort of personal level. How do you cope with working through all of this as a fat activist and organizer? And these are particularly coming from two folks who are in health or public health. Um, oh, second one, how do I show up for myself and for fat people when we're literally being taught about and graded on the obesity epidemic? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so the second one was taught about and graded on the obesity epidemic in terms of like in a professional setting or a school setting, just to make sure I'm tracking, or do we know? Uh, student of public health. Gotcha. Um, so listen, I've not been a student of public health. I'll give you some ideas, but I don't want to pretend that they are road tested, tried and true. <laughs> um, what I would say is I think that you can still do smart research-driven uh, work that accounts for anti-fat bias and that holds fat folks humanity, right? I think you can still talk about uh, fatness in the ways that your program requires you to and find ways to push back, right? You can still do smart, scholarly, thoughtful work uh, that refers just as much to uh, research about the effects of anti-fatness and the stigma that fat folks face as you do about sort of any beliefs about the intrinsic danger of having a fat body, right? I actually think that's smarter and more complex work to take into account more and broader factors, including social factors, including trauma histories, including all of that sort of stuff. Um, fat people are complicated, like anybody. Bad, lots of things happen in our lives. <laughs> take into account more of those things than just like, I see you, you're fat, therefore these will be your health outcomes, right? Um, the other thing that I would say is, um, I think it's worth, you know, even outside of the realm of like graded assignments, I think it's worth uh, having conversations with your professors and saying, hey, I'm really uncomfortable with this rhetoric and here's why. Or I'm having a really hard time with this because it feels like such a narrow view on such a broad topic, right? You, there are a bunch of ways to sort of kind of get a foot in the door to a deeper conversation so that even if the program isn't changed for you in this moment, that you can start to plant seeds with your professors and help them understand that the conversation here is changing and it's gonna to need to continue to sort of change the way that they teach and think about this stuff so that it doesn't get entrenched in the like, you know, 2001 to 2006 levels of like freak out about like, everything's gonna make you fat, French fries or cigarettes, blah, right? <laughs> uh, so that's what I would say on that front. 
on the how do you make it through, uh, again, we're in a Zoom room full of organizers. You all know, you gotta develop a pretty good sort of sense of gallows humor to make it through a lot of the work that we do, a lot of the work that we do. Uh, my main method of coping, as Howell knows, when I was working on LGBT rights, was that I was the keeper of all the hate mail that we got in our office. And I took a great deal of delight in like <laughs> getting letters from people who would say things like, we were sending out educational mailers to straight cis people on LGBT issues. And someone wrote back to us and was like, please take me off your mailing list. I am not gay and I never was. Like as if we had a list of gay people and those were the only people we were sending mail to. Like, that's very funny to me. I got one, I sent it, I actually screen grabbed it and sent it to Howell yesterday. I got an extremely funny email from someone who was like, hey, love the show. You guys are super funny, but I've been drinking celery juice for six years and I've never felt better. So please tell me where to leave a bad review of your show. <laughs> and it was like, like I genuinely find humor in a lot of that stuff behind me. You will see uh, the top and bottom shelves on my bookshelf are all wacky old diet books. Uh, I find that stuff very funny. I think it's very funny to read a book about Ed McMahon saying like, here's how you lose weight eating broiled steaks and shrimp cocktails and martinis. <laughs> like, oh, hey. Uh, so that's what I would say is I think uh, humor is a really important ingredient for me. And also like, like many organizers, I'm powered by a grudge match, man. Like <laughs> I am powered by like a deep level of upset at the way things are. So I actually think that the, you know, getting angry and allowing myself to feel angry is a big part of that. Angry and funny. My favorite, my favorite Aubrey. Angry. <laughs> you, and me, funny. Kim Abbott. So, yeah. so many angry and funnies. The angriest, the funniest. <laughs> um, all right. Well, we have time for one more question. So I'm going um, to give you a chance to end with a good laugh. Yes. What is the funniest health trend you have seen? Uh, is there a trend you thought was funny, almost funny by how wild it was? Yes. I mean, so honestly, I'm now at a point where I'm like, kind of all of them are that to me. <laughs> I've now gone full galaxy brain in meme world on like, oh, every diet is like both like gruesome and terrible, but also pretty funny. Mm -hmm. um, I would say the one that has stayed with me the longest is there is a trend like maybe six years ago called raw water. And the idea, <laughs> look at your face. I want a gif of that very measured reaction. As opposed, my question is this, is that the opposite of fizzy water? Oh, that would be amazing. I like the idea of rebranding it. Hello. Um, I like the idea of rebranding it that way. No, it was straight up like, just like drink water out of streams without any, without boiling it, without any filtration, without any anything. Uh, there was The Daily Show had done a segment about it years ago and they interviewed Marion Nessel, who's like sort of the grand dame of uh, public health and nutrition sort of research. And they were like, is this a good idea? And Marion Nessel, who's a real treat to watch, just went, no, what are you talking about? You don't know what pooped in that water. <laughs> I was like, yes, Marion Nessel, that's correct. Uh, but it was like, you know, like a dude with like a, you know, very serene facial expression, like white dude, bl long blonde hair, beard, white linen clothing, talking about the health benefits of raw water. And boy, oh boy, it's just a real treat when people are just as much a caricature as you think they are. I mean, the other one I will say, and this was like one of my first episodes to record of the show, if you would like to hear my personal favorite, extremely funny. Uh, there are two. I think pretty much everything related to juicing is very funny, very funny, um, as if vegetables somehow become magical when you turn them into liquid, as if their properties like completely change when they're juiced. Uh, <clears throat> Moon Juice uh, is an LA uh, based boutique uh, that is owned by a woman named Amanda Chantal Bacon, who is a complete and total caricature of Los Angeles wellness weirdness. 
uh, and celery juice, as previously mentioned, uh, was brought to us by someone who calls himself the medical medium, uh, who says that he speaks to a spirit from the future, who tells us about medical advancements that science can't prove or disprove currently because they're too advanced and current scientists wouldn't know how to, uh, how to prove them right or wrong. So take that. Uh, I think it's very funny when you build into the marketing of your diet, like no one can tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> this is the only thing that works. So that's what I would say. I think both of those are both like kind of a bummer, but also very funny in their way. Well, it's delightful. I think, um, you know, right about it. There are a bunch of uh, Montana kids on this podcast, the drink straight from the stream message we're all just like, oh, oh Giardia. Oh, yeah. 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 Beer yes. poop you all are familiar with the raw milk debate. You all know plenty <laughs> oh. about raw foods. Um, yes. Here's the other thing that I will say, a, a secret for this audience and this audience alone, because I feel like you all are likelier to understand. The thing I'm currently trying to get my hands on is uh, one Annie Bukacek, public health official, elected official from Kalispell, uh, has a uh, weight loss book called The Best You Can Be One Day at a Time. Uh, and all I want is to find that diet book and use it as an excuse to talk about Annie Bukacek and public health officials who are COVID deniers. Uh, so if anybody has a lead on Annie Bukacek's <laughs> weight loss book, let me know. Uh, but that's like a real Montana Express. I also had a little uh, flight of fancy. I uh, Howell knows this. I'm sort of outing myself in a moderately embarrassing way to say, I watch a lot of MPAN. Like I do a lot of streaming of the Montana state legislature. I have an uncomfortably deep relationship with people who have never met me. A weird parasocial fight that I'm having with Derek Skies, it doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> uh, so I also had an idea at one point about a raw milk show. We'll see, we'll see if it comes to pass. Um, Aubrey, I know you probably can't see this, but the chat is going wild. Um, yeah. the, the news of ask me about my feelings about that. rep fuller let's yeah, go and, everybody <laughs> all i want now is for you to like suddenly hold up a pumpkin that has the maintenance phase <laughs> uh logo carved into it a lot we've redistricted podcasts yeah um, just delightful you know what i'm gonna make that happen so here's what we have ahead of us team there's three things one we need to find aubrey a copy of annie bukacek's diet book Two, we need to carve some pumpkins for Aubrey uh, for whatever her next on-screen um, appearance is. And three, uh, we need you all to fill out your evaluation. So as we're winding down, we're gonna put that, uh, we're gonna put that link into the chat. Um, I wanna hear all the, the amazing things you have to say about Aubrey. Um, I can't carry the weight of you know, the Aubrey stand by myself. So um, please join us, fill out that, fill out that evaluation. Aubrey and, stand, um, also the name of my country that I'm forming. Aubrey, Aubrey stand. stand. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, just like I'll say, I'm going to make myself invisible and let you do housekeeping. Um, thank you all so much for having me for what turned out to be a very long form Craigslist post for this weight loss book. <laughs> um, it's such a joy. Uh, I always say yes to Montana. Um, thank you all so much for having me and for your incredible, 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 very hard, very grinding work uh, to shift the balance of power in a state that could use a shift in the balance of power team. Uh, so I'm going to go away. I'm going to let you wrap up. Thank you so much, Aubrey. Before you go, well, oh, you're gone. I'm back. Oh, you're back. Whew. Look at that. Um, it's like, um, you know, um, Thank you so much. I want to uh, just extend all of our appreciation for your willingness to come and help us uh, dig a little deeper into anti-fat bias, anti-fat politics and policy and how the work that we can do ahead of us. I think that this is, you know, we organizationally, we're on a learning curve here. I think we're all on a learning curve together and we appreciate your expertise and your time and your willingness so much. And I wanna say again, um, Aubrey pointed out in her background the top and bottom shelves of her bookshelf, but obviously the middle shelf is her amazing book, What We Don't Talk About When We Talk About Fat. 
If you fill out that evaluation, you're entered in a raffle to win one of three signed copies. That's very exciting. And if you don't win one of those copies, you should run right out and buy it and read it. And another plug again for maintenance phase podcast, um, the best 50 to 75 minutes that you will ever spend every other Tuesday. Um, so thanks again, Aubrey. You're Hi, such team. a delight. You're the Back best. Back at you, bud. Thank Talk you. Talk soon. <laughs> All right. Okay, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, we are really excited for the rest of WPLI. Tomorrow at noon, we have a, a panel on climate equity. This is another issue that we are getting to dig into a little deeper for um, not the first time, but close to the first time here at WPLI. So be sure to join us for that and check out um, the resources, including Aubrey's slides and other resources and the listing of the rest of the workshops, Saturday, Sunday, and through into next week on our website. And thanks so much again for joining us and we will see you tomorrow.